a little while ago, I reviewed the LCR45, a resistance, capacitance and inductance meter. But that wasn't the only thing it could do. It's also an impedance meter and it could do measurements at three frequencies, 1 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz. We'll start by testing parts of different values individually. Then we'll see what happens when we vary the frequency. Finally, we'll connect an inductor and a capacitor up together and see what effect that has as well. Again, that will vary with applied frequency. Even if you don't have an LCR45, you'll find how useful it is to measure reactants at different frequencies. That will increase your understanding of electronics and help you in your construction and analysis of circuits. A resistor is the simplest of electronic components. It's the same resistance no matter whether it's DC, AC at low frequency or AC at high frequency. Its characteristics do not vary as you change the frequency. That's useful for many applications. For instance, you might want to control DC bias on a transistor, then you'd use a resistor. Or at audio and radio frequencies, you might want to attenuate a signal and attenuate it uniformly along its full frequency range. In that case, you'd build an attenuator made from three resistors. This is your Pi attenuator, input, output, earth, so called because it looks a bit like the character Pi. The resistor values depend on your amount of attenuation and also the impedance of the line. Because a resistive attenuator is brute force and the signal that doesn't get to the other end is converted to heat, then you need to be careful if you're using them with high power equipment. There's a smell in the air! The resistor is cooked! To summarise, the main thing about resistors is their characteristics are independent of frequency. It's 100 ohms, whether it be DC, 1 kilohertz or 100 megahertz. Ohm's law is all you need. Capacitors and inductors are different. Their properties vary with the frequency you apply to it. If you measure a capacitor at DC, such as you might do if you put the multimeter on resistance, you put your probes across the capacitor, then you might get a small quick reading, but then the reading will settle to infinity ohms. Yep, a capacitor is, like in the circuit, two plates not touching one another. With that, DC cannot pass. But then when we're talking about alternating current or AC, it's a little bit different because with AC, AC can actually pass through something that isn't physically electrically a conductor. The degree to which AC passes depends on its frequency. If it's a high frequency signal, then it will pass through a given capacitor easier than if it's a low frequency signal. We'll demonstrate that later on. It's intuitive, just remember the capacitor symbol. Then there's inductors, which are made of a coil of wire. Their properties also vary with frequency, as we'll get onto in a moment. But unlike a capacitor, they will pass DC. In fact, they'll pass DC extremely well, unless you're trying to draw a lot of current through them. Again, it's intuitive. Compare your jagged line of your resistor symbol with the continuous coil of wire with your inductor symbol. An inductor is frequency dependent, but in a different way to capacitors. Again, we'll test that later. Got a series of capacitors. The ratio in values between them is around 10 to 1 and similarly with inductors. We'll test each of them on the LCR45 and vary the frequency to see what happens to some of the characteristics. Now looking at the impedance function 
you'll notice there's two numbers. Yep, it's a complex number. That's got two components. The one on the left is the resistive component and the one on the right is the reactive component. Both are measured in ohms. What this means is that at 15 kilohertz, this component has a reactance of 124 ohms. And as it's negative, it's a capacitance reactance. This imaginary axis here goes from inductive to capacitance. That's plus, that's minus, and sideways, your x-axis is your resistance. So a complex impedance can be explained with a resistive component along here and a reactive component, which if it's up here is inductive, if it's down here is capacitance. That varies with frequency as we'll demonstrate later. And you'll notice its reactance has increased, 1.1K. Yep, the smaller you go in capacitance, the more resistance it exhibits when it's connected in series in an AC circuit. In the past, you had lookup tables, such as in the back of old Dick Smith catalogues. but now you can calculate it online and it will tell you the predicted reactance of a particular value of capacitance at a particular frequency. Next we'll go to our biggest capacitor we've got, which is one microfarad. It's an electrolytic and it's reading 832 nanofarads, so nearly one microfarad. But if we look at our reactants, it's still a negative because it's a capacitor, but it's dropped enormously, 12.6 ohm. So at 15 kilohertz, unless you had a very low impedance signal, a one microfarad capacitor would pass most of the signal at 15 kilohertz. Now we'll try inductors. Our middle inductor value, is like a 1k resistor. It's brown, black, red, which like how that would be a thousand ohms if it was a resistor, this is a thousand microhenries or one millihenry. Ninety-four ohms. That's its reactance. And notice it's plus. The plus means it's an inductive reactance at 15 kilohertz. You'll notice with a smaller value of inductor at 15 kilohertz, it's still positive, so it's still inductive reactance, but it's a lower number. It's only eight ohm, almost a short circuit. In contrast, if we try something a bit bigger, like this 10 millihenry, and our impedance, it's very inductive. It's 971 ohm at 15 kilohertz. So if you were to put that in an audio circuit, it would probably make quite a big difference. This is our allegedly 100 nanofarad capacitor. We're still testing at 15 kilohertz. And as we saw before, we've got a reactance of negative because it's capacitor, 123 ohm. Now, what happens when you change the frequency that we're doing this test on? We're now doing our test at a lower frequency, one kilohertz, not 15. Looking at the reactants, it's still negative, capacitor, 1.759K. In other words, we've dropped the frequency and the reactants has gone way up 
the capacitor is offering a lot more resistance to a signal at 1 kilohertz than it is at 15 kilohertz. We'll see what happens if this trend continues if we were to increase the frequency. We're doing our test at 200 kilohertz and our reactance is much lower at 12 ohm. So it's hardly offering any resistance at all at that frequency. Whereas at lower frequencies, it was offering quite a lot of resistance. So if you want to attenuate a low frequency audio signal, but let high frequency audio signals pass through, then a capacitor wide in series is your friend. Now what happens if we try inductors? We'll put in our 10 milli Henry here. We'll try one kilohertz. You can see 10 milli Henry is 65 ohm. 15 kilohertz, which is, we looked at that before. And our reactance is positive, being an inductor, 971 ohm. So it's now offering much more resistance at 15 kilohertz than down at one kilohertz. 200 it is 17.14 K which is a lot 10 milli Henry at 200 kilohertz offers a very high resistance whereas at the lower frequencies it was passing them through without much resistance at all that's directly the opposite to capacitors you might have noticed that the behavior of inductors in parallel was similar to capacitors in series and vice versa is it possible to combine them in a circuit? The answer is yes. This circuit is called a Pi network and forms a low pass filter. Frequencies below a certain cutoff are passed, unattenuated, whereas above a certain cutoff frequency, they are attenuated quite severely. The more sections in the Pi network, the more severe the attenuation is because the filter is sharper. If you want the opposite effect of a high pass filter, then you just transpose the inductor and capacitor values. Here, signals above a certain cutoff will be let through, but below a certain cutoff in frequency will be attenuated. Both low and high pass filters are widely used in electronic circuitry. Just to round off, we'll do something a bit different. Here we have an inductor, one milli Henry, in series with 110 nanofarads worth of capacitors. We'll do the test first of all at one kilohertz. And you can see that the reactance is very strongly capacitive. You can see the negative there, 1.4K. The capacitor is having a big effect the inductor is having a small effect down at this low frequency of one kilohertz. Now we will go up in frequency to 15 kilohertz. And the reactance has dropped greatly. It's just minus 12 ohm. The minus means it's still capacitive, but it's very small. It's it's not too far off being a purely resistive load, which would be the case if this component, the imaginary component, was zero. We'll go up in frequency again, up to 200 kilohertz. Now you'll see it's gone plus, very heavily inductive, 1.2K. So what this has taught us is that if you've got a capacitor and inductor in series, down at low frequencies, it's very capacitive. The capacitor is contributing all the reactants. The inductor isn't doing very much, which you can prove if you take the inductor out of the circuit. Then you go through a spot where it's resonant, where there might be a small reactance, but it's very small and it's largely resistive. Then when you go up in frequency, then it becomes highly inductive. The capacitor doesn't do much, 
it's the inductor that's contributing most of the reactants. This has been our look at resistors, capacitors and inductors. A resistor has similar characteristics at DC and AC, whereas capacitors and inductors have characteristics that vary with frequency. Your understanding of the characteristics of these components will be enhanced if you do experiments and tests at various frequencies rather than just one. You can do that with something like the LCR45 or some other instrument. Having such a measuring capability has taught me a lot and I think could be beneficial to many others as well.